recognize Council General Pavel Zizek, who is here with us tonight of Poland. Um, thank you for joining us and to all of you at home, we know that there are many of you watching out there. I wanted to give you a little bit of background about the show and why I'm so excited that it's here. I've been working with the International Center of Photography since I think it's 2016 to bring an exhibition of theirs here that was about Roman Vishniak. And then the Roman Vishniak archive moved to another museum, so that show was canceled. We had the Shim show scheduled to be after Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but then we had COVID. Um, so Ruth Bader Ginsburg was elongated during the time period that the Shim exhibition would have been here. So we still wanted to somehow have it happen. So we adjusted what was in the exhibition. It's not as large as it would have been if it were in the lower level of the museum. Um, and it is now on the second floor of the museum. So we encourage all of you that are here or those that are watching um, from home to come to the museum as you are comfortable and see the exhibition. It will be here for over a year. Tonight, we will hear from Carol Nagar, an author, poet, curator, and photography historian who has studied Shim's life and work for decades. Her long-awaited biography, Shim, David Shim Seymour, Searching for the Light, 1911 to 1956, is out now. Before we, come, before we welcome Carol to the stage, we will hear a short pre-recorded introduction from Shim's nephew and distinguished professor, Ben Schneiderman. After Ben and Carol's presentations, we will have time for Q&A. Thank you again for being here tonight. Hello, I'm pleased to welcome you to the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center, where the exhibit, Shim, Between Devastation and Resurrection is currently in place. I'm Ben Schneiderman, the nephew of David Seymour Shim, the legendary photographer who shaped modern photojournalism in important ways. His work during the Spanish Civil War and then after World War II had a distinctly humanistic approach. It focused not so much on the battles and the, and the, and the fighting, but it focused on the human drama of the uh, refugees and the orphans and the children and how they suffered from the war. His photographs in 1948 of the Orphans of War for UNESCO was influential in shaping policy, generating public attention and interest that supported the Marshall Plan to help rebuild Europe. His work was also wonderfully delightful, human, and showed people in positive ways and shared the creation of the photographs with the subjects. Often his subjects are facing into the camera. They're aware they're being photographed and they're participating in telling their story. That's an important message for all photographers and it's an important message about how photography creates empathic communications that give us an understanding of the world in important ways. I hope you'll take a look at the exhibit, take a look at the new deeply researched and poetic biography by Carol Nagar and the videos that are on the website and the davidseymour.com website to learn more about my uncle and his contributions. Thank you. Uh, I thank the uh, Illinois Holocaust Museum for inviting me today. Uh, I will tell you a little bit about the Shin biography, about my research and how it came about. And I will show you a number of images by this wonderful photographer. Um, the story started um, in a bizarre way. 15 years ago, I was in the elevator at the International Center of Photography and I bumped into Richard Wayland, uh, Robert Kappa's biographer. I had just published a biography, another one, of George Roger, who was Shim's colleague at Magnum. And I told Richard that there was a chapter that would interest him that was between, that was about the relationship between um, Kappa and uh, Roger. And uh, Richard called me all excited a few days after and said, listen, um, Ben Schneiderman, Shim's nephew, is looking for a biographer. 
and I want you two to get together. So we did. Uh, and I met Ben and I went to his uh, apartment near Washington, but I was sorely disappointed because when he showed me what he had, there was not way not enough to write about. He had only um, a, uh, a few press cards, uh, Shims Laika, a few photographs, some vintage. And I had to tell him, uh, listen, I can't do it. There's really not enough to do a biography. And fortunately, the story didn't stop there. A few years after, uh, it was on the day uh, where they were having an homage of Cornel Kappa, Robert Kappa's brother who founded the International Center of Photography, Ben arrived running into the auditorium carrying a big box. And he told me, listen, we were going to move. And I opened a, a closet. And at the back of the closet, I found that archive that was put together by Shim's sister, Hala. And that archive was a treasure trove. It had over 600 documents, photographs, press cards, letters, uh, photographs of Shim's girlfriends when he was in Poland, uh, childhood photographs, everything I needed. So I was on. And for uh, 12 years, uh, Shim's life overtook my own. I'm just getting liberated right now. <laughs> And uh, I started writing that biography. And the last year was really interesting because of COVID, I was able to work at the Magnum office in New York. And uh, I was completely alone, except for people who were sending packages. And I was able to go through his entire um, history through his contact sheets from 1932 through 1956. I looked at every single contact sheet and I tried to piece together his life. Being a biographer is a strange thing. You are trying to get under someone's skin. You are getting, you're trying to get to know them from the inside, but there's always a core of mystery that remains in the center of every being that you cannot help to touch. You cannot hope to touch. But through the contact sheets, I could at least be able to uh, figure out how she worked, how he moved, what was his strategy, how he worked with light and shadow, uh, how he uh, went faster, closer, longer, farther away from his subject. And I learned a lot through that. But I will tell you a little bit about his life. Here you see the, the cover of my book, and I chose um, an image that was of his in Paris in the early 1930s as a young man, because people often see him as an owlish Buddha, a professor with glasses, and I wanted to uh, propose uh, a slightly different image. So this is a, a photograph of um, Shim's uh, father and his associates at Central. Central was a, um, a publishing house in Warsaw uh, that was, that was uh, head by his father, uh, Shmuel. And uh, they were really special because they were uh, one of the first publishing houses to be known outside Poland. And they also published not only uh, Jewish um, Polish authors, such as uh, you know, very famous authors, but also uh, they had a whole collection about European uh, authors, such as Victor Hugo and other classics that they disseminated uh, all over um, Europe. Uh, this is one rare shim portrait of uh, David with, with his cousin. Uh, you know that because of the situation of the Jewish people in uh, Poland, uh, there was no uh, archive of his family, no genealogy uh, to be found uh, beyond his parents and his grandparents. Uh, he was born in 1911 in that family of very educated uh, Jewish people. Uh, his mother was Regina and his father was uh, Solomon. And he had an elder sister, uh, Hala. Uh, and he had a, a, at the beginning, he had a very peaceful childhood, but soon enough, uh, 
uh, a war started in 1914 or World War One, and the whole family fled first uh, to uh, 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 they, they fled to Odessa. Uh, and then they, they came back only uh, uh, once uh, Poland was declared an independent country for the first time. Until then, Poland was uh, uh, grabbed uh, by uh, Russia, by the Habsburg Empire. Everybody was pulling and pushing and trying to get uh, Poland. But finally, Poland became independent. And at the time where Shim's father was working there, Warsaw was the European city with the most, uh, um, the, the more important Jewish population, 340,000 people out of uh, several million Polish uh, Jews were living in Warsaw. Uh, this is uh, Shin's sister, Hala, with her grandmothers. This is one of the pictures I was able to get from the family archive. And this is uh, an image of Shim as a young man. Uh, we, he is uh, the, on the second row. He is the second from the right. And the other people are not identified. So Shim uh, had a life that was all traced. He was supposed to take over from his father's um, publishing house. And so he was sent to Leipzig to the uh, Book Academy, the Book Design Academy. And in 1929, this is where he arrived. This was the most modern, uh, and probably it still is, the most modern train station in Europe. And he walked over to the school and he started studying. And for uh, two years, that's where he worked. That's the, the school. Uh, it hasn't been destroyed uh, through bombing, fortunately. And also, fortunately, the archive was saved, so I was able even to access his uh, school uh, marks and uh, the, the topics that he studied in the school, uh, which was a mix of a technical um, uh, knowledge that would allow him to, uh, to uh, go and uh, take care of his father's publishing house. But also, um, he had some... Uh, teachers that were photographers, such as Walter Peter Hans, uh, Hugo Erfurth, which were very well known at the time. And he had some workshops uh, that were very important to him with Laszlo Mahoney Nodj, from whom he uh, who was the Bauhaus teacher, but the Bauhaus had been closed by the Nazis at the time. So um, uh, Mohoi Nodj was taking freelance work and he was coming to the school to do some conferences and he was a great influence on Shim. During his time at the school, Shim was able to see a number of big shows so, such as Photo Auge, Photo Eye, and he was also able to um, see some, uh, um, some uh, theater uh, by Bertolt Brecht. He saw the, the Penny Opera, the Half Penny Opera in, uh, at the Bauhaus, and he saw the Rise and Fall at, at Mahogany in Leipzig. Uh, these are some of the, uh, the books that he could have been in contact with, and there is a, uh, a poster of a show he visited. And then, um, Shim went back to Poland, but at that time he realized that the situation was uh, deteriorating for Polish Jewry. Uh, and his uh, parents uh, persuaded him to go study in Paris. And uh, in Paris, uh, he studied science at the Sorbonne. And uh, Emma on the left uh, here was his girlfriend at the time, and she studied nursing in uh, Nancy, and she visited him in, uh, in Paris. But very soon it came out that the, uh, his father's business was going bankrupt and they could not sustain him financially anymore. So he visited a friend of his parents that was called Rappaport, who had a small picture agency and called Rapp. And uh, Rappaport gave him a camera, a 35 millimeter camera, and he learned uh, to photograph and started selling images uh, to uh, magazines. 
It's a little bit like the story of Robert Kappa. These are people who had not set out to be photojournalists, but uh, without mastery of a language and being in exile, uh, photography was a very good way of starting out. Photojournalism was booming. A number of photo magazines were coming out. The Leica was on the market, and it was an ideal time to start a career in photojournalism. So this is uh, one of uh, Shim's first images. He was working for um, Paris Soir, for Regard, for Vue. Uh, and at first, he was not selling entire reportage, but he was selling individual images. And these images were taken at the Medrano Circus. These are uh, the boxing clowns. And this is one of his first stories for Regard. Uh, he visited the Léal, the, the grocery market in Paris during the night. And he was welcomed by the butchers who posed for him. Uh, he took somebody with him because he said it was pretty scary to be uh, in the middle of the night uh, in Léal. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, of bad boys roaming around. And this is a double page of one of his first reportage for Regard uh, in a Billancourt uh, mesh. Uh, most of his reportages were uh, geared towards the working class. He had uh, left wing sympathies, and a lot of his uh, first stories were dedicated either to uh, the, the strikes or demonstrations or to uh, politics or to uh, the situation of workers or people without a job. And one thing that is quite interesting for us to see is the way photography was treated, was designed in newspapers at the time. You see that now we respect uh, a lot, thanks to Magnum, uh, the limits of the image. There is often this little uh, black line around the photograph but the designers at the time in the 1930s had a completely different approach to photography. Photography was part of the layout. Uh, it was a dynamic element. It's, uh, it's um, showing the mesh, uh, the, uh, to, to show how the workers are uh, crushed by, by the mechanics of the work and to, to show that idea they, uh, encased the photographs in, um, in two uh, wheels, turning wheels. And then uh, there are a bunch of other images uh, in the bottom that are also encased in wheels. And the text and images are melding together. It's a whole different idea of design. Uh, on the left here, this is one of uh, Shim's first uh, group photographs. Uh, he met Cartier-Bresson and Capa in Paris, uh, and uh, they were part of a group called the AEAR, which is the Association of Revolutionary Writers and Artists. And as such, uh, they exhibited as a group, uh, and uh, the brochure is one of their first shows. And on the right, this is Photo Rap. This is uh, Rappaport, who was... Uh, Jim's first patron. He was taking 40% out of his earning, but very soon, uh, Shim started to make a good living. By 1933, he was making 10,000 francs of the time um, at reportage. Uh, this is a, a, a pacifist uh, meeting, uh, you know, disarm, war is insanity. And you could see that uh, Shim is fascinated by the art of the poster. This is a very dynamic image uh, built around the, the, the fists, the raised fists of the crowd and the gigantic posters that they are holding. Uh, and this is um, the, um, the funeral of Henri Barbus, uh, who was a known uh, communist and uh, a very, uh, very well known writer. And uh, this takes place at the Père Lachaise. And, uh, uh, Shim has zoomed in uh, a family with a father and the two daughters uh, standing. And this is a, a, a very um, humoristic photograph of striking workers. They are 
um, in the courtyard of a factory and uh, some of them have dressed up as women. Uh, on the right, Cartier Bresson. On the left, Chim. This is 1938 on Bastille Day in Paris. In, 19, for in the spring of uh, 1934, Chim uh, became a uh, correspondent for the magazine Regard. And thanks to him, Robert Capa and his girlfriend Gerda Taro were sent with him to cover the Spanish Civil War. And during that time, uh, these three years, Shim was uh, strongly on the side of the Republican, and he did 27 reportages that were published in the press. Uh, this is one of his most famous images. This woman is listening uh, to a speech by a socialist uh, deputy. Uh, if you look at the contact sheet, uh, which I have, uh, you see that Shim was first standing near the deputy who was on a podium, as I am now. And then he, uh, he, he saw that woman in the crowd and he went down and he went into uh, the crowd to be at the same level as he was. It was a sort of a cinematic approach. And um, the Georges Soria, who was the uh, reporter who was working with him, wrote that nowhere except in Spain could you see people that were so uh, fascinated by the words of a speaker. The, the picture has been used all over. It has been um, uh, reframed. Uh, so the woman becomes a sort of a Madonna as if she had had a Zoom, which he didn't have at the time. It has been used on the cover of a uh, a book called Espana uh, and on a blue background and uh, it's been completely changed in the sense that it was interpreted as a woman being uh, full of fear and looking at a sky with uh, uh, bombs falling off. But in fact, that's not what's happening. But it was uh, one of the, the early examples of uh, photos being uh, used for other aims than they were conceived. Uh, this is a, a family visit in Paris with uh, Shim's family. On the left is his sister. On the center is his mother. This is um, a, um, <clears throat> a dinamitero, which is a, a people who were uh, going to the front and who were uh, lighting charges and throwing them at the enemy. So he, uh, this picture was discovered in what has been called the Mexican suitcase. Uh, if you don't know the story, I'll tell you briefly. The story was that in 1939, uh, Capa uh, was in uh, the occupied part of France and he decided he wanted to save his and Shim and Taro's uh, photographs from the Nazi invading Paris. So he gave them uh, in free cardboard boxes to uh, Chiki Weiss, who was his printer. These free cardboard boxes were, had compartments. They were divided into compartments and in the, inside uh, the rim, the, um, the, the, the cover of the, the boxes, there were some um, captions that were identifying who were the photographer and where and when the photographs were taken. Uh, until then, a lot of Shim's photographs and Taro's photographs had been attributed to Kappa, following the rule that everything goes to the, the better known person. To the point, uh, for instance, where I visited a show at the uh, Jewish Museum in Brussels a few years back before the Mexican suitcase was found, and it turned out that the poster for the show of Kappa was a Shim photograph. <laughs> so uh, that happens a lot in history, and it's probably one of the roles of curators and photo historians to put the agenda straight. Uh, it has been said a lot that uh, Kappa and Taro went to the front, but Shim didn't, but that is not true. Shim also went to the front, even though he was more interested in the fate of the uh, civilian population, 
he did create some um, action images such as that one. And that is probably one of my favorite images. Uh, it was never published during his life, uh, in this image of the Civil War, but it's a very strong image. I mean, it's about the life of object, the emotional life of object. The, the typewriter is very important to Shin. He, uh, during his entire life, he typed his own stories and his own captions. Uh, and seeing this destroyed typewriter, which is like a kind of a Chamberlain a sculpture or Picasso a sculpture in the middle of ruins, must have been uh, incredible. Uh, it is as if the typewriter had been spitting out um, little pieces of uh, destruction, basically. And uh, it's a very, very strong symbolic image. Uh, Shim was not only gifted at portrait in at action, but he was also gifted at um, landscape and still life. And often a still life can uh, symbolize things indirectly even better than a, uh, a picture of, say, a dead person, which he never did. Uh, I, I like this picture because uh, it's also never been published. It was in the, uh, the Mexican suitcase, but uh, you could see on the right uh, Shim's shadow. And uh, just as a, uh, uh, a comment, Shim was a very um, secretive person. He tended to compartmentalize his life. Uh, his friends uh, often didn't meet in, uh, among each other. His love life is almost unknown. So that only uh, egged me on to uh, try to know him better. So in 1939, um, it became clear that the Republicans had lost. And this is the Spanish Republicans pouring into one of the frontiers into France. Uh, half a million refugees came into France. France was not equipped to receive them and was also not very sympathetic, even though they had taken a pro-Republican stance during the war, they did not welcome the refugees. They took away their possessions and their arms and they, were, um, they ended up in camps that were no better than concentration camps. Uh, only uh, a part of them were um, able to get out and uh, they were welcomed by Latin American country, especially Mexico. Uh, this is one of the last um, reportage that Shim did in Spain. It's uh, in Menorca, which was one of the last bastions of the war of resistance to uh, Franco. And uh, this is a picture that's also in the show that you will be able to see upstairs. These are children and uh, their teachers hiding in a, um, <clears throat> in a shelter to escape the bombings. And it's a very dramatic image because it's lit only uh, with uh, the, uh, the light of, a, uh, of one bulb. Positive uh, wealth rebuild Europe. His work was also wonderfully delightful, human, and showed people in. We have a, a little interference here. Uh, ben is not in, uh, in uh, Chicago, so he absolutely wants to come. <laughs> okay, th this is an image that Jim took in 1937. He came back uh, to Paris for a short time uh, to, for, to uh, witness uh, the the birth of his uh, niece, uh, his sister's uh, daughter, who was also called Hala. And uh, Hala, now, now called Helen Sarid, uh, lives in Tel Aviv. So uh, this on top, this is a caricature of uh, Shim as he was, as he traveled to Mexico to Veracruz with 1,500 Republicans on a ship. Uh, on the lower right, this is a picture of uh, Georges Soria, Ribécourt, who was uh, traveling with him. And the whole thing is a Roneo-typed uh, brochure that was published 
by the people aboard. A lot of them were artists and painters and uh, intellectuals. Uh, meanwhile, uh, this is a, a picture of, um, of uh, Shim's family in their country house in Advat. And Advat, which is 15 miles southwest of, uh, of uh, Warsaw, will prove very important to the rest of our story. Uh, this, is, this was a, a bed and breakfast that was run by Shim's aunt Malka and by his parents, and where he had spent all his um, summer holidays during his childhood and his youth. During the war, uh, Shim, um, uh, he passed, sorry, I'm gonna go back for a minute. Shim uh, didn't stay in Mexico. He did a short reportage there for the president uh, on the industrial uh, uh, revolution in Mexico, but he went to New York he had a lot of trouble. He was like the people he photographs. He had become himself a refugee and an exile. He had uh, left Europe because he didn't want to put his family in danger since he was a very well-known uh, Jewish and socialite figure. In uh, uh, New York, he had a hard time finding work. He couldn't find work as a photographer. So he found work for a printing company called Leco. Uh, and for two years, he didn't pick up his own camera, but he printed other people's photographs and he got very frustrated. But in 1942, he was hired uh, at Camp Ritchie to become a photo interpreter. He was part of an army of 15,000 people called the Ritchie Boys. 2,500 of them were Jewish uh, and they were hired by um, the allies because they spoke uh, the uh, language of the enemy, Polish or German or Russian. He spoke these three languages. Uh, he was hired by, uh, by the allies and he ended up in Medmanham near, near London, uh, where he examined uh, pictures taken from air allied airplanes to help with the uh, future allied invasion. And that's how the communication center looked. Uh, there, he picked up his camera again, and but he only did some portraits of the people he knew, a few self-portraits. Uh, the one on the lower right is probably a girlfriend. Uh, this is a small album that he did uh, during the war. It's a handmade album. Uh, that is tied together with a shoelace, uh, and it, where it, it bears his new name, David Seymour. He became American in 1943 as a thank you for his activities um, for the Allies. And this is a, um, a sort of a funny picture, you know, Goering, uh, Hitler's uh, lieutenant, who was a big uh, art amateur, but he stole uh, a lot of art in Europe. Uh, and um, the, uh, uh, the Herd First Airborne Div Division, with whom uh, Shim was at the time, discovered a whole cache of uh, Goering's art. And uh, they made a fun panel saying uh, Hermann Goering's art collection. Uh, this is an early picture of uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson in 1947. Uh, this is the year that Magnum was founded. It is interesting to note that Magnum was founded in New York, either at the cafeteria or on the top floor of the museum. But uh, Shim, Roger, and Cartier-Bresson were not present uh, at the meeting where Magnum was found. Uh, they were all traveling at the time. Uh, this is uh, Shim's family, one of the last pictures. They are wearing uh, the Jewish star uh, on their arm, on their armband. Uh, as you can imagine, um, they were killed by the Nazi. They were probably uh, shot in Otvotsk in the, in the forest behind the bed and breakfast that they run. 
Uh, the rest of the Jewish population, which was about 14,000 people, were deported to Treblinka and uh, they all died. But it, it took two years because before Shem was aware of his family's fate. He was trying to keep his hopes up. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they were dead. Uh, this is a, a, a little card that was sent by uh, Leko where he uh, where he was working in New York. You could see him with his uh, cap as a second lieutenant on the top. In 1947, uh, Shim started phot photographing again. Uh, he was named uh, Magnum's president. And his first assignment was called We Went Back. And uh, you could see a lot of these images uh, upstairs in the exhibition. Uh, this is an image that was taken on Omaha Beach. Uh, the uh, um, rusted uh, piece of equipment you see was um, <coughs> used on, under the, uh, um, the, the bridges, the mobile bridges that were used uh, to uh, uh, come onto the beach at Omaha Beach. Uh, of course, uh, in Normandy, uh, the uh, uh, Debarquement was photographed by Kappa. These images are very famous. And then uh, Shim's assignment was to uh, work for This Week, an American magazine, and to photograph uh, mostly in color all through Europe the trajectories of the Allies' troops in uh, Germany, in Belgium, in France, and in England. And uh, the reportage was meant to um, so that uh, Europe would receive more help from the US. Uh, it was meant to show how brave the population was and how they were bent on reconstruction. This is an image that was taken in Paris in 1947. And you could see um, uh, Shim's interest in, uh, in uh, giant posters once more. Uh, posters from the election with uh, the goals um, poster being marred by a uh, swastika. And uh, part of his, uh, he went back uh, reportage in Germany uh, in front of the uh, the Neusch Krupp factory where all the, um, the armament for the war was, uh, had been uh, made, a prostitute. Uh, the Brandenburg Gate, again with uh, Shim's uh, shadow in the middle, one of my favorite images. And the broken wings of the chariot on, on top of the, the gate, and the, the makeshift uh, pram that the father is pulling. Uh, one of uh, Shim's most uh, chilling images, uh, the crematorium at Dachau concentration camp. And a, uh, an unknown uh, soldier's tomb um, in the, at the German Belgian border. So, this is one of the first in um, the, his uh, Shim's famous series, uh, Children of Europe, uh, which was to become a book in three languages uh, French, Spanish, and English, with 60 images, published by UNESCO. After World War II, a number of um, Organizations such as UNESCO, UNICEF, and of course Magnum tried uh, to uh, bring aid to the 13 million children that had been uh, maimed or orphaned uh, by World War II. A lot of them uh, were in uh, street gangs. Some of them were selling cigarettes or, or prostituting themselves. Some of them were in reformatories and. Uh, Shim's portrait is uh, incredibly moving, maybe because he knew himself also to be an orphan when he was photographing these orphans. This is a little girl uh, who has a spinal uh, tuberculosis in Vienna. Uh, these are the children playing in, um, in uh, Vienna in the ruins. <clears throat> And uh, we'll stop for a moment on the Tereshka's image. A lot of people know this image without knowing 
uh, its story. For many years, uh, it was called, it was supposed that uh, Tereshka was a survivor of a concentration camp, and it's not true. A few years back, a Polish um, team, uh, a human rights researcher and a journalist, started uh, working uh, on, on trying to find Tereshka's family, which she had never been able to locate. And they contacted me. I gave them access to uh, Shim's uh, contact sheets. Uh, and on the contact sheets, you could see the whole story. Uh, Shim arrived in a school for traumatized children in Warsaw. And the teachers have a little assignment that's pinned on the boards. It says, uh, Toyas Dom, this is home. And the children were asked to draw their home. And most of them drew idyllic images. They drew uh, images of uh, little houses with the sunshine and the smoke coming out of the chimney and the mother preparing a meal. But this girl who was traumatized was only able to draw these three uh, fallen, which is uh, probably falling bombs, and this sort of labyrinth of, um, of lines. It's as if she's stuck. It's as if war has never ended for her. She has what we call now PTSD, which was then called uh, shell shock. She has been hurt by, uh, by shrapnel. And uh, she has a very um, uh, tragic life, spending most of her life in an asylum at Twerky, uh near um, near uh, Warsaw, a, a psychiatric hospital that still exists. And uh, the, the Polish researchers were able to look at his, her family. It turned out she was from a Christian family uh, and uh, they, they were able to identify her parents and her uh, brother. She's called Tereska Adventowska. Uh, this is part of um, Shim's reportage for Europe's children in Warsaw. Uh, he found one building that was still standing, which was a high school, and he photographed the children walking over that the uh, destroyed uh, ghetto. And one interesting fact is that the, the church that's in the background is on Novolipsky Street, uh, the street where Shim lived and where his parents' business was. And of course, uh, the street was only debris. When uh, Shim's brother-in-law, um, Samuel Schneiderman, went in 1947 and tried to find his house, uh, he saw something at his feet and he picked it up and it turned out it was uh, the, um, the plaque with the number 27 from the, their house. Uh, the, it was burnt, but the number was still legible. Uh, so uh, Shim was basically seeing the entire destruction of his, uh, of his youth and uh, his family there. After Warsaw, uh, Shim went to Otvotsk and he first uh, visited a sanitarium. Uh, and you could see here the influence of Mohorinaj in this very geometric image. And this is in uh, Naples. Uh, this is an album of, uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm gonna go back to Advots for a minute. Uh, in the workshop, uh, Shim had been told that there was a new orphanage called, uh, called uh, <coughs> Dom Dietzka, which means the house of children in Otvotsk and that he should visit it. And when he arrived, he realized that uh, Dom Dietzka was his family's bed and breakfast. In other words, he was facing people uh, who had made an orphanage out of his uh, childhood home. And it is uh, very striking that he did not take one photograph there. Sometimes uh, silence is an, as important the absence of a photograph is as important as a presence. Uh, this is in Naples, another country. Uh, uh, Italy is one of uh, where Shim visited during his uh, um, work on the children of Europe. 
This is a, a girl who had been raped during the war and uh, she's learning uh, embroidery. She is uh, in an orphanage that's run by nuns and who seem to believe that uh, embroidery is a, a good rehabilitation um, tool. Uh, this is in uh, Monte Cassino. Uh, often uh, uh, some urchins are uh, collecting shells and they are then uh, reselling them uh, to people who are buying uh, uh, metal, scrap metal. And a lot of accidents happen, of course, because they found shells that were still alive and uh, we lost them. And uh, this is in Rome and this is an incredibly moving image of a boy who has lost his arms and his eyes to the war and he reads with his lips. And again, you see uh, Shin's a fascination for the arts of the book. This is um, a spread from his book, uh, Children of Europe. Uh, this is a, a refugee from the Civil War in Greece, uh, where he also visited during his reportage. This is Budapest, a destroyed uh, bridge. And uh, this is uh, one of the images uh, exhibited in Paris uh, about Hungary. And uh, this is a rare uh, sheet of his uh, design for his own book. On the bottom, what you see is uh, children who have uh, lost uh, limbs to the war who are nevertheless uh, playing ball. And this is a double page um, of the reportage in a Life magazine. It's two of um, Shin's most famous images. In 1950, um, Shim uh, worked with uh, Carlo Levy, who uh, wrote uh, Christ Stopped at Eboli, which you might know, it's a very famous book. Uh, Levy had been arrested uh, in the 1930s as a Jew and a resistant and had been exiled in Sicily in a small village. And Shim uh, worked uh, to photograph uh, the fight against illiteracy. At that time, uh, 75 to 85% of the population in southern Italy couldn't read or write. And there was a program uh, organizing uh, schools for uh, children, but also for old, older people, for seniors. Uh, and he covered uh, that uh, program in his, um, in his uh, series. Uh, here you see an old man uh, tracing his first letters. This is a young uh, shepherd who is uh, not going to school because he's working. Uh, this is a, a very symbolic image of the, uh, the population in uh, southern Italy. And this is uh, Shim's friend, Carlo Levi. In the early 1950s, uh, Shim re, uh, <clears throat> reset his, uh, he, he decided to leave Paris and he maybe took distance with the ghosts of the Holocaust and he resettled in Rome. And uh, Carlo Levi was a very close friend. He's a, he was both a painter and a writer. And uh, Levi was a strong influence on, uh, on Shim. Uh, in Rome, uh, Shim continued to cover social and political life. Uh, this is a uh, political uh, social uh, demonstration in, uh, in Florence. Uh, this is a crowd listening to his speech. A very uh, impressive perspective of uh, umbrellas. And another political speech. Uh, in uh, Rome in uh, 1956. And then uh, Shim, who was also a, a man of paradox, embarked on a series of stories on religious uh, rituals. He was especially interested in the rituals that blended, uh, that were hybrids of uh, old cults and Catholicism. He was fascinated by Catholicism. He also did a whole reportage on the Vatican. 
And this is one of the, the images in the good, the good Friday in San Fratello in Sicily. Uh, what uh, Shim would do was mark in his agenda the dates for the uh, religious celebration, and then he would travel uh, by train uh, and uh, cover them. Uh, this is a, a really interesting festival in Kokuro. It's a, a feast of the snake of San Domenico, the, the saint that protects the population from snake bites. And uh, these are uh, non venomous snakes, by the way. Uh, this is uh, from um, from the series uh, The World of Children. As of the 1950s, uh, Kappa uh, organized a whole series of uh, group reportage by all the Magnum members. Uh, and the one is Generation X. It's about the uh, children that were born after the war, the young people. Another one was um, This is How the World Lives. And the third one was the world of children. And this picture is of Roberto, who was a young guide uh, who earned a living by uh, uh, showing tourists uh, the details of architecture in his hometown. Uh, and this is from the series Generation X. It's a young man playing the accordion. Uh, for his series, uh, Shin shows uh, youth in Italy and uh, in Israel. So the, uh, there were 12 uh, series. This is how the world plays. This is how the world eats and so on and so forth. And this is from his series on the Vatican. And it's really interesting to see that he did not only do um, official portraits of popes or dignitaries, but he also was interested in the life around the Vatican City. Like here, uh, the Ethiopian priest playing handball. Uh, this is a, um, a 1949 portrait of a uh, unrepentant um, Nazi uh, general. And uh, this is part of a series that uh, Shim did in Greece. He traveled a lot in Greece in the early 1950s. He claimed, I am a Mediterranean. And uh, he tried to find uh, sunny and less tragic subjects. That's him on his way uh, to the uh, <clears throat> to the monasteries of the Meteoras all the way up the mountain. Uh, and uh, he's uh, giving a funny show for the onlookers, obviously. Uh, this is the, uh, the Meteoras Monasteries, and this is one of the popes that was working there. Uh, and uh, a famous image of uh, Peggy Guggenheim with her two uh, uh, with her <clears throat> two dogs that she uh, usually took to Harry's bar for a sorbet. Uh, Peggy Guggenheim was a famous collector, and uh, this is on the uh, balcony of her uh, palazzo in Venice. And in the 1950s, uh, Shim became interested in Cinecita, uh, who, which was a cheaper alternative to Hollywood called Hollywood on Tiber, where all the uh, new stars. Uh, were starting their career. So this is uh, Sophia Loren, and uh, this is Audrey Hepburn, not the cigarette, politically incorrect these days. And uh, she is, uh, this is the spring of 1956, and um, Audrey Hepburn is posing in uh, Stanley uh, Donen's uh, film, Funny Face. This is uh, Ingrid Bergman. Uh, Ber Shim was introduced to Bergman by his friend Robert Kappa, who was uh, who had been Ingrid Bergman's lover, and uh, Kappa had died in 1954, uh, a little bit earlier. So, it, in a way, you could say that uh, by, through his friendship with uh, Ingrid Bergman, uh, Shim was keeping a link uh, with his friend Kappa. 
this is a, 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 from a story in Greece. This is a little girl who was given her first pair of shoes. And that is from Shim's first trip to Israel in the early 1950s. So in the show, you will be able to see more images of Israel uh, that in Israel, Shim said that he found a home um, beyond the ruins of the ghetto. Uh, it gave him hope. There was a sense that the, uh, the ideal of Zionism was very close to the socialist ideals of his youth. He also found a few family members who had escaped the Holocaust. Here he's in Tel Aviv with two of his cousins. Uh, this is uh, at the funeral of a, um, of a uh, guard that was uh, killed during a, uh, uh, some uh, uh, battles at, on the frontier. Uh, this is the first day of Rosh Hashanah in honor of the upcoming holiday. Uh, this is a, a little bit uh, triumphalist as an image. Uh, it's uh, uh, a sort of a, a part of a series on uh, the work of Israel. So there's a lot about cultivation, planting, the new industries, and this is one of that series. And in Israel, uh, Shim worked both in color and in black and white. And this is a more intimate image also in Israel. Uh, in 1956, uh, Shim was in Greece uh, doing a little story on the Parthenon when he heard about the Suez conflict. Uh, Egypt was trying uh, with Nasser to, uh, to take over the Suez Canal, uh, through which a lot of uh, British goods uh, were uh, traveling. And a war started, and he wanted to be there. So um, he found a plane, he landed there with uh, Jean Roy, uh, a Paris match photographer, and two other correspondents. Uh, this is on the ferry uh, from uh, <clears throat> for, uh, Port Said to, to uh, Suez. Uh, these are the, the um, uh, journalists he was traveling with, and you see uh, sitting on the Jeep is uh, Jean Roy, who had uh, written the full number of Paris Match uh, as a new uh, plate for the car, Balzac 0024. Uh, on the, in Egypt, uh, Shim, uh, though his sympathies were pro-Israeli, uh, showed his uh, empathy by photographing the plight of the Egyptian population who was dying of hunger. And here you see uh, people assaulting a fish truck and trying to get some food. Uh, this is a, um, a field uh, where parachutes were landing. And this is the state of uh, Suez Street uh, when he arrived. Unfortunately, uh, Shim and Jean Roy uh, decided to cover a, lot, a story of uh, an exchange of prisoners in Al, uh, Al Gamela, and they started on a deserted road, and a nervous uh, Egyptian <coughs> gunner gunned them down. So they uh, they both died three days after the ceasefire, an absurd death. Here's a telegram from uh, API Agence France Presse uh, recording their death. This is a 1956 uh, spring uh, portrait of Shim uh, in Paris by his colleague from Magnum, Elliot Erwitt. So of course, uh, one cannot help uh, wondering what Shim would have been up to uh, if he had had the gift of a longer life. And I, for one, would have liked to share a meal with him. He was a gourmand and he loved to eat. Thank you. If you have any question, I'd be happy to answer.
Um, so I, I guess I, the, the nephew approached you to write the book or what made you want to write the book? And are these wonderful photographs in your book? Uh, you wonder what, sorry. Yes, uh, there's a. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it was not only that his nephew approached me, it was the idea of a of a character that was very mysterious. Uh, people uh, didn't know him or uh, didn't know enough about him. And I think that the role of a historian is to uh, find these places that are obscure or little known uh, and to bring them into light. Uh, and so uh, what attracted me too was how complex a personality he was. He was a very good writer as well as a photographer. He wrote all the texts for his uh, reportage, which people nowadays don't do. He had uh, a very complicated life. Uh, he had so many uh, different topics uh, and he spoke a number of languages. He was very literate. All these things uh, made me curious. And uh, all the pictures are in the book. There's 110 images in the book. were trying to get under his skin. You just described that he was a brilliant writer and, and spoke many languages. But can you describe what you think his essence is? Like what his personality was or what you were able to, I don't know, um, discover about this inner person? Mm -hmm. Well, he's, he's somebody uh, who uh, uh, drew um, a sort of wall around himself. He hid himself from view. Uh, he was very compartmentalized. Often his, his, um, his friends did not know each other. Uh, there are very few uh, love letters that were found. One, uh, a few by a theater student from the 1930s and uh, a few by Irene Papas, who was one of the stars he photographed in Hino Chita. Uh, Shim was a very thoughtful person. He had very obscure friends, very learned friends, archaeologists, musicians, uh, architects. And he uh, was described by Kappa as a better photographer than I am. Uh, he was um, a musician. He played the piano. He loved to play Chopin and originally thought he would be a musician. And he was also a chess player. And I think that these two passions are very visible in his photographs. The chess for the strategy and the music for the harmony. Um, he uh, was very attached to his Jewish roots, but he also distanced himself from them by uh, choosing a name that was not Jewish, Shim, maybe for practical reasons because his uh, name was hard to, uh, to pronounce, but I think also because he wanted to be a laic in France in a place where uh, religion is separated from politics. Uh, his heart was on the left, but he never took a card from the Communist Party. Is that enough? <laughs> And the rest maybe is a mystery. <laughs> so impressive listening to you standing on all this time. Um, I I am uh, uh, I am an Egyptian Jew, so this is a, um, a population that doesn't exist anymore. My generation is the last to have been uh, born in Egypt, uh, which is maybe why I'm drawn to uh, all these stories of exile and displacement and changing languages. Uh, and my family uh, emigrated to Paris in um, the early uh, 1950s when I was a child. Uh, our passport was stamped no return, uh, and it's only in, uh, as of 1972 that Jews were allowed to uh, go back to Egypt by Sadat. 
I spent um, my youth in Paris. I studied uh, history of art, anthropology, and linguistics. And I started uh, writing about uh, painting. And then um, as I was uh, working for a Zoom magazine in Paris, I was given the assignment of a meeting with uh, Robert Doineau, the famous uh, French photographer. And I think it's because of that encounter that uh, I turned my uh, life towards studying photography. So uh, I continued and uh, I came to the States in 1987. Uh, that's a love story. Uh, and uh, uh, now I spend about eight months a year in the States and four months a year in Paris. Did Jim's family try to escape from Poland or did he try to encourage them to escape? Uh, yes, him and Hala tried to get them out, but they were uh, extremely stubborn and they were sure that the Germans would not reach outwards. They, they, were, they had illusions like a lot of people. But uh, Hala herself and her husband uh, settled in Paris in 1934 and then uh, settled in the States. Thank you, um, and thank you, Carol, for such an amazing presentation. Uh, in regards to the children's home in Atwak, since you were able to see his archive, and I know he took photographs of the sanatorium nearby, right. are, <clears throat> are you assured he didn't take any at the inn? You are. Yes, I am. I, I looked. I, I was uh, hoping so much to uh, find a picture with the same background as the image of uh, his family there, but I think he was stunned. I mean, uh, it's, it's an emotional shock uh, to arrive in a place where you spent all your, your summers as a child and to see it uh, as a home for orphaned children, Jewish children. It's still, it's incredible. And if you see that in a fiction book, you wouldn't believe it, but it's real. <laughs> and just to follow up on that, because Carol pointed this point out to me as I was preparing for the show, um, on Yad Vashem's website, there is a an online exhibition called The Children of Atwak, and you can see the family home um, and all the children in the story of, yeah, of that there's a, that, there's a woman uh, called um, Oliva who has written a whole um, story about how she, she came to work as a teacher uh, she was looking for survivors of, for, from her family, which she didn't find. And as she was walking in the street, she saw a, a troop of children uh, with uh, wearing uh, pieces of clothing. And um, there was a Russian uh, mm. soldier with them who helped them out. And they settled into that home and they got a grant and she started uh, the orphanage. It's an incredible story. And they, they had all sorts of uh, uh, theater shows and plays and uh, songs. And uh, yeah, it's really interesting to look at the Holocaust uh, Museum archive. Such a beautiful presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you for bringing these pictures to life. I was fascinated by the photos of Mariora. Greece. I just came from there. And did you say that he lived in Greece or that he just loved to travel in Greece? No, no, he loved to travel in Greece. And uh, the Meteoros, um, his uh, topic on Meteoros, he traveled with a, with a uh, Greek writer called uh, uh, Ahavantinu. I, I found a little piece of her, uh, his or her manuscript. Uh, and they were planning on publishing a book. Uh, but the book never came uh, to fruition. Uh, I think that's a reason why Shim is not so well known or was not so well known. Hopefully he will become better known with this show and this book and other things. It's because during his lifetime, he was so busy that he didn't have the possibility of putting a book together. And the only one is uh, Europe's Children, which is uh, mediocre in terms of uh, reproduction. Uh, there's one um, uh, 
a Japanese book called Little Ones, uh, which is a little better, also about children, but that's it. Um, and it's only in, uh, you know, in, as of the 70s with Colonel Kappa concerned photographers that he's been started to be, to be rediscovered. And of course, the Mexican suitcase was a big thing in, in the rediscovery. Let's give uh, Carol a round of applause for the program. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, thanks again, Carol. And thank, thank you for everyone here in attendance. And thank you to everyone that's attending virtually. If you haven't had a chance to check the exhibition, it is out now on, on the second floor. And I look forward to seeing you all for the next program. Thanks again.